Presented by Caltech. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce Krishna. You might think that I'm uh, doing this introduction because uh, he was a prize po postdoctoral scholar in Lauritsen, and that's true, partly. And you might think I'm doing this introduction because we both have a strong and common interest in the strong interactions, and that's uh, true. But I'd like to think the real reason that I'm doing this introduction is because of our common heritage. We both grew up in Toronto, and uh, we're undergraduates at Canadian uh, universities. So you shouldn't be surprised if uh, perhaps after a few glasses of wine at the dinner tonight, you find Krishna and I in a corner with a couple of beers, lamenting the fact that center ice at the old Maple Leaf Gardens is now in the cereal aisle of a supermarket. So we like to think when we have, when we, uh, you know, ha that our prized postdoctoral scholars that we have here are rising stars, and uh, that's true. And in the case of Krishna, we really outdid uh, ourselves in the rapidity of his rise. He came to us after a junior fellowship at Harvard in uh, 1996, and he left us in 1997, taking up a faculty position at uh, MIT. Now I have to say, it's a tough thing when you're at Caltech to lose someone to MIT. <laughs> now it's true, it's the blow is a little bit softened uh, by the fact that he was taking up a faculty position there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, around 2010, I managed to get over it. And uh, so I, I, I happily accepted the, the invitation to, uh, to introduce you. So Krishna's uh, research is, the uh, basic theme of his research is what I call strong interaction physics in extreme environments, uh, very high baryon density, like in the cores of neutron stars, or high temperature that occurs in the early universe, or in uh, heavy ion collisions. He's really a field theorist at heart. That's at least my sense. He's done pioneering work, uh, discovering new phases uh, of the strong interactions at uh, high density, so-called color flavor locked phases. And the title of his talk today is Jet Quenching, the most liquid liquid in the universe. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, my fellow long-suffering Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Um, the last time the Leafs won the Cup was in 1967, um, and it's, uh, I think, quite clear that the next time is still a long way away. So um, thank you very much, and it's, a, it's an honor to be invited to be uh, um, back on this great occasion. I, I look forward to visiting the Burke Institute many times in the future. Um, so. I have to start by telling you what liquid I'm talking about, and then um, a little bit later, we'll uh, I'll explain what I mean by jet quenching. Um, the big context for this talk, the, the grand opportunity, the whole um, field of experimental endeavor that the theory I'll be talking about relates to, comes um, from colliding what I've called here nuclear pancakes, so nuclei Lorentz contracted by Lorentz factors of 100 at the relativistic heavy ion collider, 1400 at the LHC. By slamming these two nuclei together, what you're doing is making little droplets of Big Bang matter. The stuff that filled the whole universe a few microseconds after the Big Bang is being recreated for the purpose of studying its properties. Um, there are five um, large experimental collaborations doing this work. Um, Phoenix and Star are the two collaborations at RIC, Elise, Atlas, and CMS at the LHC. And these experimentalists are answering questions about the properties of the stuff that filled the microseconds old universe that can't be addressed by any conceivable astronomical observations made with telescopes and satellites because the length scales that they probe it on are so different. They're studying its material properties as opposed to its cosmological properties. Um, and it turns out that the properties of this stuff are interesting in ways that was not anticipated when uh, these goals were first defined more than 20 years ago. Um, 
they're interesting because this, this stuff, which turns out to be a liquid, shares common features with forms of matter that arise in Kinet's matter physics, in atomic physics, and in black hole physics, and that pose challenges that are central in each of these other fields. Um, so I just had the phrase quark gluon plasma on the other slide. That is the original name of this liquid. Um, what is quark gluon plasma? Well, um, as I would have described it um, 20 years ago, it sounds boring, actually. It's the infinite temperature phase of QCD, which means that entropy has won over order. There's no interesting symmetry breaking. The symmetries must be those of the Lagrangian. And furthermore, asymptotic freedom tells us that in the infinite temperature limit, this stuff is a weakly coupled gas of quark and gluon quasi-particles. So that doesn't sound very interesting to a condensed matter physicist. Um, between then and now, lattice calculations of QCD thermodynamics um, starting in the 90s showed that there is indeed a, a crossover transition like the ionization of a gas that occurs in a narrow range of temperatures around 2 trillion degrees in the wrong units, 175 MeV in the right units. And at this temperature, if you think of the universe cooling down, the universe is filled with quark gluon plasma and it, that, that stuff condenses into hadrons, protons, neutrons, pions. And what experiments are now doing is um, recreating little droplets of stuff above this temperature, reproducing the stuff that filled the microseconds old universe. And um, about 10 years ago, we learned that unexpectedly, this stuff is a liquid. Um, I won't spend too much time um, um, describing this ten, now 10-year-old discovery, but I do want to say a few words about it. This discovery came from um, analyses of RIC data comparing data to hydrodynamics, and it's data on how little blobs of quark gluon plasma expand and explode. And I'll, I'll show you one further slide on the next slide. But what we've learned from this is that this stuff is a strongly coupled liquid um, in the sense that the dimensionless parameter eta over s which will occur in my talk only as a single symbol. So eta over s, eta over s, eta over s, you can lump it together. But if you want to know what the two symbols mean, eta is shear viscosity and s is entropy density. And this is the right kind, the right definition of a specific viscosity for a relativistic system. It's the dimensionless characterization of how much dissipation occurs as a liquid shears, as liquid flows with shear. And it turns out that um, the eta over s for quark gluon plasma is much smaller than that of um, all other known liquids except one. I won't give a talk now on the except one, but for those of you who are curious, the except one is ultra-cold fermionic atoms at nano-Kelvin temperatures instead of tera-Kelvin temperatures um, with an, with atom-atom cross-sections tuned to infinity. Um, this um, so-called unitary Fermi gas, also badly named, um, comes close to the QGP on this axis. Now, this discovery now made a decade ago is actually what has made QGP interesting. So this is the uh, one sort of historic sl historical slide. This is from a uh, talk given by Bill Zeitz in 2008, explaining how we learned in the um, eight years before 2008 that this stuff is a liquid. The idea um, is that you look at collisions in which a nucleus going out of the board hit a nucleus going into the board off center and made this um, oval-shaped blob of stuff. And if that oval-shaped blob of stuff was a hot gas, what happens next is a hot gas has random thermal motion. All the particles are uncorrelated with each other, moving in random directions. The thing explodes. And if you have a little blob of hot gas and it explodes, the explosion is azimuthally symmetric. No matter what the shape of the piece of gas is, if it's a hot gas, uncorrelated motion, once it explodes from the size of a nucleus to the size of a detector, um, the explosion is circularly symmetric. So what you measure is the, um, is the anisotropy. You look at the final state and you Fourier decompose it in azimuthal angle phi and um, the, 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 the first non-trivial term is the mul thing that multiplies cos 2 phi and that coefficient is called V2. You measure V2 and you find that it's enormous. So this is the cos, this is the, the cos phi distribution, it's actually the phi distribution of charged particles produced in very early experiments at RIC. And you see that for appropriate kinematic choices, you can get explosions that are um, anisotropic by factors of three. They're hugely anisotropic. You quantify this, you compare it to hydrodynamic calculations, and you learn something about viscosity. Why is that? Well, if this were a very viscous liquid, as it starts to expand, its viscosity 
will produce heat. Heat is random thermal motion, and you'll end up with less anisotropy. So this was the story um, in the mid-2000s. Um, between then and now, this line of development has um, greatly um, um, become much more precise and much more nuanced and really deserves comparison to what cosmologists do when they look at the CMB. So this is the CMB on the left, it's the Big Bang. And on the right, it's a, this is a little bit unfair because on the left, that's data. On the right is theory. Um, on the right is a theorist's calculation of what a heavy ion collision might actually look like. Um, it's not a cartoon like this. When two nuclei collide, they are intrinsically lumpy. There are quantum fluctuations, and there are just the fluctuations in the positions of the nuclei. So that's four little bangs, um, a theorist's conception. On the right, one big bang, real data on the left. And with that picture in mind. Quick question. When these two pieces collide, do they have enough time to thermalize? Well, that's, that's a talk in itself that I wasn't planning to give. The answer is yes, and I could explain to you why yes, but let me uh, not do so. What's the time scale for thermalization? It turns out that if you, the, the length scale is the thickness of the sheets. So you take a nucleus, Lorentz contracted by a factor of 100. The sheets are now, the, the nuclei are about a tenth of a Fermi across. And it thermalizes within two or three sheet thicknesses. And this is, um, how do I know that? I'll tell you afterwards. Um, it's not the talk I was planning to give. But it's actually, it's a really cool talk, just not the one I was giving. Um, so in cosmology, you have initial state quantum fluctuations. Alan Guth is very interested in them. Um, processed by hydrodynamics and appearing in data as um, the debris from an explosion on the left, which you then look at an angle and you Fourier transform and you call the Fourier co coefficient the C sub L's and you measure them. And from those C sub L's, you learn about the initial fluctuations, we hope. You also learn about the fluid, for example, its baryon content, its dark matter content. By analogy, in heavy ion collisions, there are initial state quantum fluctuations. They're much less interesting, but they're certainly there. They have to do with the positions of protons and neutrons inside a nucleus. Um, those initial fluctuations are then processed by hydrodynamic evolution. The result is an explosion of debris. You look at that debris in a detector, look at how it's distributed in an angle, Fourier transform it, and the coefficients of the Fourier transform, V2 was the first of those coefficients, but there's a V3 and a V4 and a V5 and a V6. You measure them. And by measuring those, you will ultimately learn about the fluctuations and also about materials properties, in this case, 8 over us. Now, cosmologists here have an obvious huge advantage. Um, they measure C sub L's out to L's of thousands now, so they have a great advantage in resolution. In heavy ion physics, we measure up to V6. V8, perhaps. But heavy ion physicists have a huge advantage, and that is we have a billion bangs. Cosmologists have one bang. We have a billion of them. So a lot of the art in heavy ion physics is how to take advantage of that advantage. How do you study correlations? How do you study fluctuations? How do you learn from the fact that you have a billion bangs to study? Um, the basic message um, that is the only part thing that I want to leave you from this is that the simple fact that these initial ripples on the right survive to be seen in the data tells you that the shear viscosity can't be too large. Because if the shear viscosity were large, in that hydrodynamic evolution, they would get washed out by dissipation. So to give you a sense of the state of the art, this is theory curves going through data. The data is V2, V3, V4, V5 um, from uh, LHC collisions at the top, RIC collisions at the bottom for particles with different um, uh, transverse momentum. And you can see that um, this is now a, a game where if you want to be in the game, you have to do as precise comparisons as in cosmology. Um, these are few parameter models, just like in the, in the same sense as the cosmology has a few parameter models. Some of those parameters are very interesting, like 8 over s. The fit to RIC data gives an 8 over s of 0.12. The fit to the LHC data gives an 8 over s of 0.20. And then you take advantage of the billion bangs by looking at how V2, V3, and V4 vary from event to event. And the same model that describes the average data describes the fluctuations too. So um, what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that the quark gluon plasma at RIC, whose temperatures are somewhere between, say, TC and 2TC, 
and the quark-gluon plasma at the LHC, both have an 8 over s, which is um, between 1 over 4 pi and 3 over 4 pi. So the way I've written on the slide is that 4 pi 8 over s is between 1 and 3. Um, there is some evidence that 8 over s is smaller at the lower RIC temperatures, so that the most um, liquid liquid is the liquid produced at RIC. The LHC liquid is a little bit less liquid. Um, there are still remaining uncertainties. They are not statistical uncertainties. They are systematic uncertainties. The um, thing I've swept under the rug here in this talk is to tell you what are the model assumptions. So there's some things in these curves that are parameters that you can fit, and that's good, that's, that's, that's fine. But there are also some model assumptions having to do with the initial fluctuations, and that is what people are working on improving right now. Now, but we won't talk about it further. Well, is 4 pi 8 over s between 1 and 3, is 8 over s of 0.12 to 0.20, is that small or big? We can compare it to um, air. 4 pi 8 over s for air is about 10,000. We can compare it to water. 4 pi 8 over s is in the many tens for water. We can compare it to liquid helium or liquid nitrogen um, or any terrestrial liquid um, studied in the laboratory except the ultra-cold fermionic atoms. Those are all between 10 and 100. The ultra-cold fermionic atoms have 4 pi 8 over s of around 5. Um, and why am I multiplying by 4 pi? Well, it's because string theory has given us a benchmark here because 4 pi 8 over s is equal to 1 for any of the by now very many known strongly coupled gauge theory plasmas with a holographic description. Um, so it has become conventional in our field actually to quote 8 over s in units of 1 over 4 pi because of this benchmark for infinitely strongly coupled gauge theory plasmas um, where the calculation can be done rigorously using ADS-CFT. Um, I'm not going to talk much about ADS-CFT here. That's another talk that I could give. Um, the message of all of this is that this liquid has no quasi-particles. It's a liquid, it's a liquid, it's a liquid. Um, this can be quantified by saying, well, I'm going to forget what Krishna just said. I'm going to try and describe it with kinetic theory. So let's try and describe this liquid with a bunch of um, particles of some sort flying around. What mean free path do I need in order to get an 8 over s that small? The answer turns out to be that the Eight, the mean free path that you need turns out to be much small, smaller than 1 over the temperature, and that makes no sense. So there is no self-consistent kinetic theory description of this stuff. It's a liquid. This makes it interesting because there are other fluids in physics with no quasi-particle description. The one that was shown in the previous talk two talks ago is the strange metal phase of high temperature superconductors. Um, there too, people um, disreputable theorists like myself um, have been trying to use ADS-CFT to get a qualitative understanding. It turns out actually that the black hole descriptions of liquid quark gluon plasma and strange metal phases um, uh, are continuously related. So there may be analogies that remain to be explored. I'm not going to go this route today. I want to ask how can we learn about this liquid via experiment. So um, what next? Um, so you've discovered or recreated the hottest liquid phase of matter that has ever existed in the universe. Why do I say that? Well, if you could go um, 10 times hotter, 100 times hotter, 1,000 times hotter, QCD becomes weakly coupled, and you will have um, a gaseous, traditional gaseous plasma. So this is the hottest liquid that has ever existed in the universe. And you've learned that it's the most liquid liquid that we've ever seen in the laboratory. So now what do you do? Um, there's really three things that you want to do. First, you want to characterize this liquid at its natural length scale. So quantify 8 over s and characterize its other properties um, as well as you can. Second, dope the liquid. Um, this liquid has a phase diagram. It's on the top right. Just as high TC materials have a phase diagram on the top left. For the high TC systems, doping means excess of holes over particles. Same here. The doping axis on the right-hand side, the horizontal axis of the phase diagram on the right, is excess of quarks over anti-quarks. So one of the currents of this field today is to study doped quark-gluon plasma. And um, well, both phase diagrams here are cartoons. Um, and this is the cartoon that I could talk about at length. The color superconducting phase that uh, was mentioned by Mark is off to the bottom right. And Peter, Peter where's, is Peter Goldreich in the room? Yeah, the question you asked, Peter, an, an answer that I could give in a third talk that I'm not giving is um, 
about phases of matter that might exist in the centers of neutron stars, not white dwarfs, but neutron stars. That's in the bottom right of this phase diagram. Um, the progress there's right now in heavy ion physics in mapping this phase diagram out is all around here. And, and that's um, a fourth talk that I'm not giving. Um, so you can characterize it, you can dope it, or you can probe it. Um, you've, nature has given you this interesting system. You want to know how it works. You want to probe it at multiple length scales, and in particular at short length scales. Um, if you can find and build a sufficiently powerful microscope, this liquid, you know from QCD, it is at short distance scales made of weakly coupled quarks and gluons. Um, Pulitzer and friends don't have to give their prizes back. Um, QCD is asymptotically free. So if you can probe the quark gluon plasma at short enough distance scales, it is made of weakly coupled quarks and gluons. And so the, the, the big question for the coming decade is how do weakly coupled quarks and gluons assemble themselves such that what emerges is this strongly correlated liquid. Um, so you need a microscope. Here's an example of a microscope for the condensed matter system. This is an example of a microscope for the quark gluon plasma. Um, and that's the direction in which I want to go. So it'll take me, um, I'm going to get back to microscopy only at the very, very end. Um, I want now to tell you about a way of probing quark gluon plasma that um, the, most of the rest of the talk will be in the character of characterizing its properties. True microscopy is going to wait for the last couple of slides. But this, I believe, is the best path that I know towards true microscopy. What you would like to do is take a blob of quark gluon plasma and do, do a scattering experiment on it. Um, this is the closest you can come to that. Um, so what is jet quenching? This is jet quenching in pictures at the LHC. Um, these, are, these are two events at the LHC unfolded. So this is um, a polar angle as a muthal angle. And this grass down here is the debris of the quark gluon plasma. This is 30,000 particles in the detector. And then there's a pile right here and a pile right here. Whoops, sorry. Or there's a pile right here and a pile right there. Those piles of energy in the detector are called jets. And these are back-to-back -back jets. They're two pi apart in um, azimuthal angle. This one has an energy of 205, 206, 205 GeV. This is 70 GeV. So does that mean momentum conservation uh, has been lost? No. This is jet quenching. What has happened is that in the same collision where you made the soup, there was a hard scattering that made a back-to-back, -back, let's say, um, quark-antiquark pair going apart from each other. And each of them had to fight its way through the soup, and it lost a lot of energy. And unless they are produced at the dead center, one of them will have more soup to go through and will lose more energy. One of them will have less soup to go through, will lose less energy. So the one that lost more energy came out with 70 GeV. The one that lost less energy came out with 205 GeV. This is jet quenching in a single event at the LHC. This phenomenon was discovered in a much more sophisticated analysis at RIC. Um, because at RIC, the jets are lower in energy, and you can't quite see them with your eye the way you can at the LHC. Um, so here are some um, qualitative questions that the data from RIC and the LHC pose, the jet, the jet data pose. Uh, the basic question is, um, if you're a QCD physicist and you study this jet or you study this jet, they actually look um, familiar. They're not strange objects. They, they look like regular jets, um, and there are ways of quantifying that. And yet, they've lost probably more than half their energy, or of order half their energy. So how can a jet plowing through a strongly coupled soup like this lose so much of its energy and come out looking pretty ordinary? Um, now, there's two parts to the answer here. The first part, I think, is well understood, and it is what you would expect from a strongly coupled plasma. One way that that could fail would be if the energy you lose piled up around the jet. And um, this is another answer to your thermalization question. What, in a strongly coupled plasma, what happens to the lost energy is that it rapidly thermalizes. And so if you look in this um, event and you ask, where is the 100 plus GeV that this one lost? The answer is that it's spread out over the, all of the grass down here. Okay, it's thermalized. Um, and that can be understood quantitatively on this slide, which I'm going to skip. Um, the question I want to focus on is, well, OK, fine. You've lost half your energy. That, that half of your energy got thermalized. It became more plasma. But still, how do the jets themselves emerge looking so similar to vacuum jets? 
Um, the best way to answer this question, at least at present, is a hybrid approach to jet quenching, in my opinion. Jet quenching, what makes it so interesting is that part of the story is weakly coupled and part of the story is strongly coupled. Um, it's that like the blind man and the elephant, you need, uh, you need to look at this particular elephant with tools from perturbative QCD and with tools from strongly coupled calculational methods. So by a hybrid approach here, I mean a model, not a theory. I want a model in which I treat the hard physics with perturbative QCD and treat the energy loss as at strong coupling and see what comes out. So, well, what is DEDX, the rate of energy loss for a parton in quotes in a strongly coupled gauge theory? Let's use the toy model of a strongly coupled gauge theory which has a simple ADS dual, namely n equals four super young Mills theory. And so while we're at it, let's ask what jets in that theory look like when they emerge from the strongly coupled plasma of that theory. Um, but it's not quite as easy as that because I'm writing jets in quotes instead of jets. And the reason for that is that n equals four super young Mills theory doesn't actually have jets. So um, what we're doing is a little bit disreputable here because I'm trying to learn about jets in QCD by using a toy model which doesn't have true jets. Um, nevertheless, different theorists um, uh, have come up with different um, proxies for jets and I could describe several of them. They each have pluses and minuses, but I will only describe um, the one that is going to take me down the path I've chosen to present in this talk. Um, so uh, PC is Paul Chesler. What Paul and I have done <coughs> is to take a proxy for a jet that was first um, um, written down in 2008. It is a light quark in N equals 4 super Young Mills theory boosted to high energy. And we will shoot it through a slab of plasma. This is a venerable toy model for jet quenching in the heavy ion physics community. It's called the brick problem. So before you go and treat heavy ion collisions, a toy, a place that you start is you imagine you have a brick of plasma, you shoot a cork through it and ask how much energy is lost. We have done the ADS-CFT version of that calculation for the first time in uh, last year. Um, we will, folk, we have a brick of plasma, shoot a light cork through it, look at what comes out on the other side, and how does the answer change if you change the thickness of the brick from x to x plus dx? That's going to give us DEDX. Now, to repeat, what is going into the brick is not a true jet. What's coming out of the brick is not a true jet. But we can still, we can make an apples to apples comparison by comparing what comes out to what goes in, even though in QCD you have oranges instead of apples. Um, along the way, we will get new intuition, as often happens when you do an ADS CFT calculation. So, this is the calculation. Um, this is um, ADS -CF an ADS-CFT calculation. The boundary of ADS is at the top of the diagram, so the gauge theory lives up here. Um, the um, um, ADS direction, the, 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 the fifth dimension, goes downwards here. And this is vacuum, this is vacuum, this is the slab of plasma. And what that means is that the metric in the bulk has a horizon which is located here between 0 and 10 on the horizontal axis. Now, how do I make a jet, in quotes? This is, um, I produce at this red dot, I produce a string whose endpoints are near the boundary, shooting one to the right, one to the left. This is a quark-anti-quark -quark pair in ADS. Um, and the quark and anti-quark are joined by a string. And I've taken a photograph of that string at an early time, then the next time, then the next time, then the next time. So the endpoint of the string is following a black curve, which you see here. The string itself. It's here, and then it's here, and then it's here. Ooh, then its shape changes as you drag it through the plasma. Then it's here, and then it's here, and then it's here. From this, you see that the shape of the string is pretty similar here as there. That's what tells you that the jet that emerges on this side is very similar in shape to the jet that went in. And this comes just from geometric optics, because what are these blue lines? These blue lines are null geodesics in the bulk. So the calculation is finding null geodesics in um, the gravitational metric. What is energy loss? Energy loss is blue lines falling into the horizon. So you can think of each of these blue lines as bringing a packet of energy with it. These packets are lost. These packets get out. So the energy loss is you look at how much energy, how many blue lines were there here, how many blue lines get through. That's the energy loss. That's the energy that's not lost. Um, in this particular calculation, 64% of the incident energy comes out on the far side. 
the jet that comes out is broader in angle. That translates, that is related to the fact that this black, this endpoint is, is drooping down at a larger angle than this one. That's um, an increase in the opening angle of the jet. And everything I just said is completely geometric. So jet quenching in a perturbative QCD calculation is, um, well, it's many things, but it's certainly not intuitive. And here we have geometric intuition for everything. Uh, this was fake in the sense that I made my quark way off to the left here, much closer to what we actually want is to produce a quark right at the edge of the plasma, shoot it through the plasma, see what comes out. That's easy also. Um, what do we get from this? Well, we get that the shape of the outgoing jet is really the same as the shape of the incoming jet. Um, its energy has to be rescaled and its angle has to be rescaled, but when you rescale both, the shape is really the same to better than a percent. It's not mathematically identical, but it is very, very uh, similar as you can see. And we get an analytic expression for dE dx. This is dE out dL, L is the thickness of the, of the slab. And it depends, it has a right hand side which is um, reasonably complex, but not that complex. Uh, many people in the heavy ion community have always used power laws for the right hand side here. One message for the heavy ion community is the right hand side is not a power law. Um, it depends on a stopping length. That stopping length is parametrically given here. And what we are going to do in the next part of the talk is this is the deliverable from ADS CFT. And I'm going to now use this, I'm going to glue this onto perturbative QCD to make a hybrid model. So this is what I'm going to take from the ADS calculation is this expression for DDX. This is how the, the quark loses energy. It loses most of its energy in the last 20% of the distance it travels if you let it go all the way to its stopping length. Um, this is an analytic calculation. There's a parameter here, kappa. Kappa is a dimensionless number. We, in the following, will treat that as a fit parameter. So we're going to try applying this formula to QCD with this as a fit parameter, and we'll see how it goes. So in this hybrid approach, we um, take the dEdx from above, and then we take a jet from Pythia, which is Pythia is perturbative QCD incarnated into a Monte Carlo code. And what Pythia describes is a high energy parton which fragments into a shower. And for every rung in that shower, every line in the shower, we will apply energy loss along the line. There is, this is not theory, this is a model. This is really the dumbest thing that we could think of. This, is, this shouldn't work um, because there's a lot of physics. Um, we, we're, we're gluing two theoretical frameworks together uh, blithely. Um, so, the, 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 the logic behind this model is that the interaction of a jet with a medium is intrinsically a multi-scale problem. The production and the fragmentation of this hard parton should be described by perturbative QCD, but the energy loss in the medium shouldn't be, and that's what we're trying to capture. Now, we also forget the brick. If we want to compare to data, a brick is no good. So we now will take somebody else's hydrodynamic calculation of one of these expanding cooling droplets and um, apply this formula for the EDX in that droplet, and that droplet has a temperature which varies with position and time. That affects this, which affects this, which affects this. Um, so these are the ingredients for the model. It has one free parameter and a whole bunch of model assumptions, but one parameter. So we need to fit that parameter and then compute observables. So um, I'm going to show you 18 slides of LHC data in a flood just to give you a little bit of the gestalt of how the comparison goes. Um, for people like Lance sitting there and Svi if he's in the room and David if he's in the room, um, I can talk much more afterwards. So what's the simplest thing you look at? Well, it's just the number of jets with a given momentum. Um, if all the, jet, the number of jets with a given momentum is some falling curve as a function of momentum and if everybody loses energy, the curve is shifted to the left, which looks like the curve has shifted down. So you count the number of jets in gold, gold, in lead, lead collisions, divide by the number of jets in PP, and you find that there's fewer jets. This is jet quenching. The black is CMS data. The red is our model. And this is where we do the fit. We fit our model to this one data point. OK, so this, this agreement right here is a fit. Everything else is a result. So this is number of jets with momentum from 100 to 260 GeV, data and model for um, head-on collisions. Now you increase the impact parameter of the collision, the suppression gets a little bit less. You look at more grazing collisions. You look at um, 
truly grazing collisions, our agreement has gotten worse. This we understand because we are only describing the energy loss in the quark gluon plasma phase. There is further energy loss at, in the very late stages um, in the hadron gas, and we have left that out. So we're actually not surprised by this, but it gives you a sense of the quality of the comparison. Now, what's the next observable? Well, count, look at asymmetric pairs, like in that event, two events I showed you at the beginning. Take the asymmetry, momentum of, so 205 minus 70 divided by 205 plus 70. Plot a distribution of that asymmetry for PP collisions in pink. The reason why there's a broad distribution like this is because of three jet events. Um, um, gold gold collisions in black and our model in pink. Our model is the, the, the sort of um, red band. No further fitting. Um, that's for head on collisions. Um, less head on, less head on, less head on. Um, now you can, those were post dictions. Now we can make some predictions. Photon jet events are the cleanest way of studying jet quenching. You look for an event in which you produce a photon here back to back with a jet. This photon flies out unimpeded by the soup. The jet loses energy. So the photon here will tell you the initial energy of the parton that became this jet. This is the best way of doing these measurements, but it's also lower in statistics. Um, the event samples going into these data had billions of events. The event samples that will come have tens of thousands of events at most. The thing that will most improve when the LHC turns back on in heavy ion physics is the error bars on the coming plots. So how are, how are we doing? Well, uh, the, the data has large error bars, but this will give you a sense of how we're doing. I'm not even telling you what the observables are. Black is always data from the LHC, and um, red band is our dumb model. Then these are true predictions for Z-jet correlations not yet measured at all. So I've showed you five observables as a function of momentum and centrality or impact parameter, all with one fit parameter, and it works shockingly well. Um, the worst case is this one. Um, this is the fragmentation function. There's a lot of, there's more cheating that goes into this than in the other plots. Um, uh, only for the experts will I tell you what the cheating is afterwards. But um, again, look at the pink and look at the data. We're not doing that badly. Our model has to break down on the far right here because um, what we're comparing here is a partonic fragmentation function to data, and that's uh, not kosher down here. I'm not going to, for the non-experts, I'm not going to define this plot. I'm showing it to you so, so the experts can see where the dirty underwear is. Um, this is the dirtiest of the underwear. So um, upon fitting one parameter, lots of data is described well within current error bars. The value of the fitted parameter is such that the stopping length for QCD, the QCD plasma is about three to four times longer than the stopping length in the N equals four super Young Mills plasma at the same temperature. Uh, this is quite reasonable. The two theories have different degrees of freedom. Um, QCD has fewer degrees, less entropy at a given temperature than N equals four super Young Mills. So this is quite reasonable. Um, in this sense, we are characterizing the plasma. This, this parameter kappa is a way of characterizing the strength of the interaction between the plasma and this probe. And by doing this exercise, we're getting a sense of the value of this kappa, which is to say the, val the value of the stopping length for a jet in QCD. Um, the message here is that jet quenching looks like perturbative fragmentation plus strongly coupled energy loss. Could it actually be that? Um, I hope not. And all this success poses a critical question. If jet quenching observables are seeing the liquid as a liquid, which is the, what the success of this comparison of um, dumb model to data says, um, how can we see the weakly coupled quasi-particles that must be there at short distance scales? Ultimately, the goal for the coming decade is understanding how this liquid emerges in the sense of condensed matter physics from an asymptotically free gauge theory. Um, if the only thing jets do is see the liquid as a, as a liquid, that's bad news. So the challenge going forward is how can we use jets to resolve the short distance structure of the liquid? Um, this will require advances in theory and experiment. Um, jet quenching phenomena involve physics over a range of scales. So somewhere in the data, there's information about the medium on multiple length scales. We need to figure out how to tease it out. Um, in this context, the long list of successful comparisons that I showed you um, in the previous um, raft of slides are in a sense something of a disappointment. Um, although of course I'm, I'm tickled too, but um, 
the, why are they a disappointment? Well, what is this hybrid? What did I glue together? I glued together weakly coupled vacuum physics and strongly coupled medium physics. Um, what I'm interested in is the weakly coupled medium physics. I want to see the weakly coupled short distance structure of quark gluon plasma and then course in my resolution and understand how those degrees of freedom organize themselves. So I believe that in the long run, the most interesting uses of this model will be to see where it fails. So how can we make the model fail? Um, what we need is further more discriminating observables. Um, things that we are working on include um, bottom quark energy loss, photon plus jet, and most important, we need to add one more ingredient into the model beyond just energy loss, and that's transverse kicks. When a parton flies through the soup, it loses energy, but it also gets kicked. And we have not put that in the model, and that means that at this point, we have not yet tried to fit or look at angular shapes of the jets. And that is where I think the money is to be found. Um, why do I think that's where the money is to be found? Well, um, Rutherford would have understood this point. What we want to do, I have, a, I have a quark shooting through the soup. If the liquid is a liquid is a liquid is a liquid, if it's a liquid on all length scales, then Rutherford knows you will never see large angle scattering. Actually, you will um, exponentially rarely see large angle scattering. The probability of scattering by a, a momentum k perp is e to the minus k perp squared. That's basically diffusion in momentum space from lots and lots and lots of soft scatterings. If, if what, I, what, what we have here is a liquid, um, uh, transverse momentum broadening, as it's called, is Gaussian in k perp. On the other hand, if this probe once in a while sees a hard thing that it can scatter off of, it won't backscatter like it did for Rutherford, but it will scatter at a larger angle. Because as Rutherford knew, when you have point-like scatterers, you get 1 over k perp to the fourth for that probability distribution. And 1 over k perp to the fourth has a power law tail. So um, you, what we need to do is to look for evidence of rare, but not too rare, large angle scattering, hard scattering of partons off the, off the point-like things in the medium. So the challenge then, the ultimate experiment, um, hopefully less than a decade away, is you um, tag, tag an event with a photon, tag a jet with a photon. So I have a photon going this way. That tells me the initial energy of the parton that's going to become the jet. This parton fragments, and I look at the debris of the jet, and I will select particles, say with, um, so let's say I have a 200 GeV jet, and I will select the particles with momenta between 10 and 20 GeV, and I will look at their angular distribution. I will do that in lead-lead and compare it to PP. And then I will do everything I just said at the LHC and compare that whole shebang from LHC to RIC. That's what you need to do. Um, if you just start thinking about statistics, you need billions of events, not thousands of events. Um, and, um, but if you can do that, you will then be able to look at this for this 1 over k perp to the fourth scattering um, at, for, for particles with, with different momentum. And that basically allows you to do microscopy on the plasma with different resolution scale. So these measurements need high luminosity, large samples of suitably tagged jets. Um, this is coming at the LHC late in the decade. LHC run three, supposed to have the required luminosity. Um, at RIC, what we need is a high rate state of the art jet detector. This detector has a name. It's called S Phoenix. Um, it's coming. The latest date is 20, the most recent date is 2021. Um, and that was actually, if I go back many, many slides, when I showed you the um, microscope in this slide, this is the S Phoenix detector um, um, at a, as a CAD drawing. This is supposed to be a real detector in 2021. And I will end there. Um, as I already said on this slide, there's a bunch of other stories that I could have told you, but I decided to tell this one, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>